Hi, everybody. So uh, my name's Simon King, and I'm a principal at Octopus Investments. And uh, Nathan and Joe have very kindly asked me to introduce the next couple of talks. Um, but before I do that, I'd just like to take a few seconds to thank them both uh, for pulling this event together. And the rest of the Playfair guys, I think you'll agree, it has been a spectacular uh, set of speakers and a really accessible and engaging set of talks that they've been giving. So if you join me in giving them a round of applause, thanks guys. But there's more great stuff to come and I think this last session uh, is really gonna top it off. Um, so first up we have a panel session with Ben Medlock uh, and Callum Chase moderated by Sally Davis. So if you guys come up. So Ben is uh, co-founder and CTO at SwiftKey, which invents intelligent keyboard interfaces that uh, learn and predict inputs. SwiftKey is uh, wildly popular. It's now on over 250 million devices. Uh, ben holds a degree in computer science from Durham and a PhD in natural language and information processing from Cambridge. Callum is uh, author of Pandora's Brain, a techno thriller about uh, the first conscious machines and is a regular speaker on the topic of AI. He's also author of the Internet Startup Bible, a business bestseller published by Random House. And Sally is the digital editor of the Financial Times Weekend. She's particularly interested in the ethical and social dimensions of technological change, including its relationship to urbanization, the environment, gender, and the future of work. And the guy's going to be chatting about the societal and ethical and judicial uh, judicial implications of artificial intelligence and AI systems. Take it away, guys. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, I guess to start with is not so much the question of why we'd be worrying about ethics and the singularity, but why we would be worrying about it now. I mean, given that some of the achievements that are trumpeted by the likes of Google when it comes to AI are things like uh, an algorithm being able to beat humans at pixelated Atari games that were developed 40 years ago, you know, why is it that we would start to be concerned about the ethical implications of artificial general intelligence in the year 2015? Um, we've already heard speculation that uh, we may get to artificial general intelligence in the next few decades. It's fascinating to me, I've been thinking about this for a good few years, decades, and it's really only since Nick Bostrom's book came out last year that a very broad audience has started to take that idea seriously. And now there's a big division in the uh, AI research industry between those who think no way is this going to happen for centuries, and on the other hand, people who, who think it could well happen in decades. Uh, and I think there's a huge swing towards those who think it could happen in decades. Christoph Koch is one elder of the industry who's, who recently seems to have started to think it could happen in decades. So, it's a big event, and it may well happen soon. Perhaps there's two reasons why, why now it's, it's sort of grown into the public consciousness in the way that it has. Um, and one of those is the fact that uh, narrow AI applied to specific problems is, is ubiquitous in a way that, that has exploded in the last five years. So. Um, and partly that's with the advent of the smartphone, so, so people are using AI technology for so many different things, you know, mapping, input, recommendation, all this kind of stuff. Um, and so, so we're starting to become aware that actually there's a real practical use for this, and that pulls it off the pages of science fiction and, and into the real world. But then at the same time, people are starting to talk about um, the 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 progress towards general AI, and um, I think we're starting to see signs that things like the use of neural networks, which the concept's been around for a very long time, actually Alan Turing, um, when he first talked about computing, talked about two types of computing, the, the sort of von Neumann architecture that we use today and uh, the, the neural architecture, and Dan talked a bit about that before, which was fascinating. Um, but I think for the first time, we're starting to see neural networks being applied in the real world. And you can now start to see a path, potentially, to something much more general you know, actually working. I think that's, that's probably why we're now starting to take this a bit more seriously. 
Okay, so I mean, assuming now is the time to be talking about the ethical and societal implications of artificial general intelligence, um, what what does that mean? What are what kind of questions are we asking when we talk about the ethical and social dimensions of artificial intelligence? Are we asking whether these machines or algorithms are going to be good for us or bad for us, or are we asking what kind of ethical and social obligations are we going to owe to those machines? Yeah, it, it's both. Uh, in the short term, it's is it good for us? And in the long term, possibly, is, is, are we good for them? Um, ethics in, in AGI uh, has come to mean, I think, has come to mean the friendly AI project. How do you make sure that the first superintelligence is of benefit to humans? Um, and I don't know whether it's true, but it's famously said, and, and our friend from DeepMind can tell us later, perhaps, whether it's true that Demba Sassavis insisted on being bought by Google that they set up an ethics committee to study exactly that issue. Um, so so there's, there's the ethical question of how do we make sure that superintelligence doesn't wipe us out, for instance. That would be a, a good thing to avoid. Um, but then there's also, well prior to that, there's lots of ethical problems that are going to arise because AIs are going to increasingly make decisions for us. Um, and a, a great example is self-driving cars. We're going to have self-driving cars fairly soon. Um, and whether there are drivers in them or, or not, they, the, the computers are going to be making decisions. So for instance, uh, a car is driving fast, a kid runs into the road, the computer is fast enough to know I can either hit the kid or I can swerve and crash into a lamppost and my driver dies. The computer's going to have to make that decision. Now, you know, obviously we're probably going to program a set of decision <coughs> pathways into it first, but <coughs> there's going to be plenty of times when the computer at the end of the day makes a decision, and that's a big ethical issue. Yeah, I, I, um, I think somebody posited this idea that there could be an ethics switch in the car where as a driver you decide whether you want the car to favour your own life or the, <laughs> or the life of, of the grandmother who you're about to run down. Um, but actually I think what, this, what those kinds of thought experiments do um, is cause us to, uh, to, to potentially ask some pretty fundamental questions about what justice means. Because uh, in our culture we are we are heavily agent focused. So our justice system is all about identifying the agent for a particular crime and then punishing that person. Um, and so we, we want to know who's responsible. We want to know who to blame. Um, and when you start to, to think about machines making a lot of hard decisions for us, it kind of immediately becomes obvious that that approach doesn't really work unless we're happy to blame machines, but we, we find that sort of unsatisfying for obvious reasons. Um, and I think actually the challenge should be these questions should make us uh, reevaluate how we do justice. So, for instance, the, the, the sort of penal justice that looks for blame and reparation uh, is very different to restorative justice models, for instance, that say, actually, the, 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 the agent, the culpability of the agent is, is not the most interesting or pertinent question. Because, you know, if I've, if I've ended up, um, you know, I don't know, robbing a sweet shop, there's probably very good reasons from my background why I've ended up doing that. And it's probably not really my fault from a certain perspective. Um, and if we think about ethics and justice as a way of creating the best outcomes for society. So take away the element of blaming the agent and think about how do we create systems that, that produce the, the kind of net best results. Then actually those can be applied to AIs as much as they can be applied to people. And this is going to be obviously very difficult to kind of change the, the inertia in our, our systems of, of law and justice. But I think maybe we have a shot at doing that now. It's interesting. I mean, that analysis sort of flows from the assumption that it is always going to be inherently unsatisfying to hold machines accountable as moral agents. I mean, I think one of the interesting things about neural networks as a basis for AI as SwiftKey users and DeepMind users is that, as far as I'm aware, I mean, it's often called black box AI, right? So we know that it works, but we can't necessarily identify the mechanism by which it works. Now, that's extremely problematic when it comes to areas um, involving healthcare or financial services where we traditionally need a kind of chain of causation from a choice to a consequence. Um, but would 
it be possible to conceive of a moral agent in the age of AI um, without that sort of ne the necessary element of kind of intentionality or human beings able to understand that sequence of intentionality? Uh, I think Ben's being perhaps a bit more radical than that and suggesting let's not worry so much about the existence of a moral agent. And, I, and a really good example is the debate about killer robots. So there's been a lot of talk that we shouldn't allow robots in, in a field of warfare to pull the trigger. It should be a human always that, that pulls the trigger. So the uh, American sitting in a, a call center type place in, in Omaha, uh, dropping the bomb on somebody in, in uh, Palestine, it has to be a human who makes that decision. But what if the robot or the AI system is better at making that decision? Because the AI has better, better ability to discriminate between combatants and civilians. Wouldn't it be better to, to not be killing civilians rather than having moral agents making the decisions but just because we think that's a good idea, but killing civilians? But you already see the challenges. I mean, you see the sort of vehement response to the use of drones and the fact that in, the, in contemporary uh, sort of social understandings of moral responsibility, the idea that some human is not staking their life and yet it's possible to kill from afar because of the lack of a moral agent in that equation, in the case of drones, it, it, people get outraged. So it seems that we've got a long way to go before it would be socially acceptable um, for the kind of scenario that you're sketching out. I think what you need is a much, much more rigorous framework for testing consequences or for, for evaluating consequences. Um, so in this case, it, it, it's really difficult, obviously, because in the limit, it's impossible to compute with any degree of accuracy what the consequences for a particular action could be. But we could outline various different categories of consequence and, and take a, a, a rigorous approach to evaluating the consequence in each of those areas. So there's the social consequence, there's the sort of the, the um, general well-being of, of people involved, there's physical, physical harm. You know, this kind of thing, I, I think... I think people who've been talking about restorative justice for a while have probably been thinking about this, but by and large, our, our ethical systems are not up, up to this kind of thing. If I can shift the focus slightly, um, one thing that struck me uh, in many of the events I've been to about AI and, and hearing different companies um, and academics talk about the technology, um, <coughs> those solutions that do exist currently, um, almost always, or as far as I can tell, always, require a human being to set the objective or the goal of the system and then the system can via a number of different clever means work out a way to get towards that goal but it seems to me one feature of human behavior it's not just our capacity to make intelligent decisions it's also our capacity to set our own objectives um, is it conceivable that machines are ever going to be able to take that step in terms of setting their own objectives as opposed to just very cleverly working towards those that we tell them to I think that's pretty much the definition of artificial general intelligence. A, a, a machine which has its own volition, if you create that, you've got an AGI. You know, an AGI is defined as a machine with all the cognitive abilities that a, human, a normal human adult has, uh, including volition. And that is the hallmark. Once we get one of those, super intelligence isn't far away, probably. And actually, that, that's, that's an interesting point, because if you think <coughs> about what happens in, in humans, we have this set of basic biological primitives and our objectives, the objectives that we set emerge out of that. So we, we are driven to achieve certain things which don't need to be talked about in detail. Um, but because of that, we end up constructing uh, ways of cooperating and achieving them in a sort of transcendental uh, in this transcendental psychological layer. Um, and maybe that's, that's the only way for this to work. Maybe f as we develop ever more intelligent machines, we need to provide them with the, these basic, basic primitive imperatives. And then out of that emerges their ability to set objectives. Well, that, that's premised on your acceptance of the idea that all of human society, art, religion, all of the complex things in the fabric that make up our day-to-day -day lives do, in fact, evolve out of a kind of evolutionary biological determinist mm -hmm. uh, set of circumstances, which I'm not sure everybody would accept. Um, but perhaps at this point, it might be a good moment to open it up to the audience for questions. Yes, we have a gentleman in the middle here. Some, something of a 
something of a contradiction that if you, if you really believe that the singularity is going to happen, then at some level we become indistinguishable from machines. Uh, if, if you believe that, then would you argue that the same rules should be applied you know, across you know, people and machines, or if, or if not, why not? I, th I think um, the idea that we merge with machines, that's the very positive outlook on the singularity. That's Ray Kurzweil's view, for instance. A lot of people think Ray Kurzweil is a bit crazy, but a lot of people take him very seriously. Um, the, the flip side of it is that the superintelligence thinks that we're a bad lot and wipes us out, or thinks that we might think it's a bad lot and decides to wipe us out before we try to wipe it out. Um, if we do get to the happy place, and there is a superintelligence and we merge with it, uh, then, yeah, for sure, w you know, the moral, the moral world will apply to that combined entity. I, I think it's actually a very interesting question because you already start to see um, these sort of problems emerging. Um, I mean, there's obviously <coughs> been some stuff written about post-humanists and transhumanists, but, you know, you don't need to be, going, you don't need to be embedding microchips in yourself um, to recognise that the thing about smartphones is that we feel they are intimately part of us and our human expression in a way that we didn't with desktop computers. So, for example, you could interpret the outrage that uh, people expressed over the way uh, the U2 album was downloaded onto their smartphones and the way that was perceived as an invasion of privacy. We already are starting to see these things as kind of an expansion of ourselves as individuals. So um, I think, you know, it's, it's entirely plausible that machines will be indistinguishable uh, from humans as they become ever more capable. I mean, I do think that as, as we progress towards, well, as we progress down the, the path of researching um, AI and AGI, we're going to learn a lot about what it means to be human. And I don't think that there's any sense in which there's an inevitable confluence and, you know, that humans are just machines in any kind of uh, sort of degrading sense. I think when we have this conversation in 30 years' time, we'll have learned so many more interesting things about the human brain, about the human psyche, about how the sort of the, the, the psychological layer that the humans inhabit has evolved out of these, these biological primitives, that the conversation about what, what a human is is probably going to be rather different. Um, and that's pretty exciting, I think. If, if I can actually ask Ben a question at this point, let, let's assume that we do accept the evolutionary biological determinist argument for human culture and human intelligence and all the things we do with our brains that aren't sort of serving base biological motives. If we are going to be encoding machines with these base drives, what should they be? Would they just be the same as the human base drives or should we try and conquer the worst kind of aspects of our own nature and try and pre-program the machines that we're making now to have more virtuous inclinations than we have naturally. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's where you want to... That's where, where ethical research is really interesting. So the question is, what kind, of, what kind of ethical imperatives, at a very simple level, could you imbue machines with? And we have no idea what, what that will evolve into, but you know, we, obviously human beings are fundamentally driven by the, the need to self-propagate, at least at a genetic level. Um, and you wouldn't need to do that. You, 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 could, you could give a machine a, a very different type of uh, basic imperative. I think because of the complexity of this stuff, what we can't do is prejudge where that will end up. We have to experiment. We have to, you know, kind of lean startup approach to uh, engineering AGI. Experiment, try, look at the results, disconnect it from the internet, um, try again until you're pretty confident, and then... Uh, release it. It's interesting because it raises the question of whether the advent of AGI is simply going to pose a challenge to our systems of ethics or if it's actually going to fundamentally change the content of it because one could argue that many of the ethical principles by which societies are structured are based on things like the fact that we all die, the fact that we're all mortal. But if we're in a situation where a brain, um, be it an artificial one or one that's been scanned from a biological brain, could be reproduced does that mean then that, I mean, how does that change the ethical imperative not to kill, for example? So mm -hmm. um, it seems like what we understand ethics to be in the advent of AGI is going to be completely exploded. It, it is, and the problem's worse than that, because we don't have a coherent, unified, universally agreed set of ethics. You know, we've been arguing about ethics since the ancient Greeks, and we're pretty much no closer to a, a conclusion than, than they were. There's a massive divide between consequentialists and deontologists and 
you know, there's more moral codes than, than there are people, or at least uh, certainly more than there are countries. Um, and actually, Ben, for the first time in this session, I'm glad we've got something to disagree about. I, I don't think we can take a start-off approach to this. I think we have to get the instruction set right before the first AGI arrives. If, we, uh, if the first AGI, arri AGI arrives and quickly becomes a superintelligence, which isn't necessary, but it's entirely possible, mm. and if we've got the coding wrong, we're in a bad place. Mm. So you know, we have to get the instruction set right, and it is not easy. You know, given that we have no agreement about what a coherent ethical code is, and, and we all have very confused ethical systems, uh, how do you program the right set of ethics into, into an AI? It's a really hard problem. Mm. But it's a problem we have to get right, and we've maybe got a few decades, maybe we've got a few centuries, but if we've got a few decades, we'd better start working on it now. Mm. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, yep, right at the back. Yeah, so human intelligence cannot be separated from culture. You don't have <coughs> intelligence if you isolate human, a human mm. person completely. So if you're going to mimic human intelligence in a machine, then you almost have to bring up the machine in some kind of culture. It means that the machine has to interact with other individuals in some kind of culture, especially ethics and all those sorts of things. They only make sense in a particular culture. <coughs> so it's not that you can program some complicated algorithm. You have to kind of bring up an individual within another group. Yeah, absolutely right. And you can take a step further back, and um, human intelligence is, is very much embodied so the, the, there, is, there isn't a sort of concept of a disembodied intelligence that looks like human intelligence, or at least that, that would be the argument of the um, embodied intelligence camp, which I think is right, um, embodied cognition. So I, I think you're right, and we, we need, if, if we're going to build real human-like intelligence, then we need to build that into beings that interact and, and actually, you know, interact in the way that, that we do with, with bodies that, that are out in the world. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be like us, but then the next step, as you say, language and culture, interaction, um, there, is no, there is no intelligence without those things. And, and we are, we're going to have to go there if we want an intelligence that looks anything like, like human intelligence, definitely. I'm, I'm in the other camp. I, I don't think that uh, a human intelligence has to be part of a body. I think if you could take my brain out of, out of my body and put it in a vat uh, and uh, arrange so that it could live for you know, thousands of years, I don't think I would stop being me. And I don't think I would stop being a human. But I wouldn't have, have body for a long time. Uh, and anyway, we may well not create... You know, The first AGI may well not be a, based on a human template. It might be, but it might be a completely alien intelligence. We, we just don't know at the moment. Questions? One more. one more question. Well, how about we take two questions together and we'll try and round them up. Yes, two gentlemen here. <laughs> Just to be fair. Hi. So um, if AGIs are uh, possible to produce, you know, uh, en masse, um, there seems to be potential for, you know, individuals, if they can produce their own AI, some people may produce them with malevolent intentions and so on. So I want to ask, will there be some kind of rev uh, regulation of AGI and what kind of system might that be? Could you even have a vision like a citizenship, you know, where you hold AGIs responsible and, you know, if they break the bounds of acceptable ethics, then there's the consequences. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, okay, so slightly different question. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are bounds on these things. Um, and also there is um, intelligence and there's self-awareness, right? So I can build, you know, a thing that can beat me at chess and beat me at everything intelligently, but it doesn't have to be self-aware. Um, I can build self-aware things. I mean, that, that's I, I'm in that camp that I can. Um, and then there's something, you know, there's physical about the physics. The laws of physics will actually determine how clever these things can get, right? It's not, it's not magic. You know, we don't just create one and suddenly it um, solves every single law of physics and we understand the universe completely. It's bound by physics too. You know, I mean, there's theorems, right, in theoretical computer science, like Solomonoff induction, which I'm not an expert on, and the Gödel machine. There's a lot, you know, there, there are limits and bounds to these things. I mean, they can still get scary, but, you know, it's not infinite. So that, I just wanted to say that. I'll take that as a comment. Um, do you two, do, do either or both of you want to address the first question about regulation and AI? 
I think the answer to both questions is yes. <laughs> um, That's brief. <laughs> yeah, uh, so regulation, um, I don't know how to solve it, um, unfortunately. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here, <laughs> scrounging a living on the conference circuit. Um, but, but I think we... Uh, I'm paid, I should add. <laughs> I think, I think reg talking about regulation, opening a dialogue um, about what it even means to regulate sort of, sort of non-moral agents, if you like, or non-human agents. Um, that is going to be, I think, one of the major dialogues of the next five, ten years. But it's, it's going to be complex, and there's going to be a lot of politicians involved. Hmm. I took your question slightly differently. I thought you were asking, would AGIs become persons, and hence part of a sort of moral universe? And I'd say, yeah, once they pass the Turing test or, or a modified version of the Turing test, they're persons, they're part of the moral universe. And Peter, to your, your question, um, sure, their uh, superintelligence is going to be bounded by the law of physics, but laws of physics, but they could be massively more intelligent than we are. We don't know how smart we are in the bound of possible intelligences. We've got no reason to believe we're anywhere near the top. We might be way down near the bottom. Okay, I think that's it. Thanks very Thanks, much. Yes. If you join me in thanking the panelists. Thanks,